pleasure to introduce our contest master for the second half, which is the International Speech Contest. And that will be the Northwest Division Governor, Tiffany Salinko Howard. Tiffany? Brownwood. 
While growing up in Bromwood, there were some clear signs that there were lots of jerks in that place, more than many other places. It wasn't just that my mother's flower garden would be trampled on a regular basis. It was the fact, it was the fact that teachers in my high school could be caught during unguarded moments referring to students as Brownwood brats. And who could blame them? What we today call social bullying was so intense that some students chose to eat their lunches in the restrooms rather than in the cafeteria. Back then, I wasn't so sure that being a jerk was such a bad thing. Back <coughs> in high school, I didn't get to go on very many dates. And when girls rejected me, they always talked about how a nice, what a nice guy I am. <laughs> As though that were some reason for disqualifying me. <laughs> <laughs> out of Fortunately, that issue got cleared up once I went away to college. And that's where the real eye-opening experience occurred. It was on the campus of the University of Wisconsin. Go Badgers! <laughs> where I found out, to my horror, that the prevailing folkism there was if a person was from Brownwood, then that person had to be that dreaded insult that ends in the word whole. <laughs> <laughs> to survive in that larger world, of course, I avoid telling people where I was from. But it became clear and apparent that what I had to do was to take the worst examples of Brownwood behavior and commit to performing the opposite. More specifically, the positive opposite. For example, instead of quickly putting down people based on how they looked, I avoided judging people based on how they dressed, or how they appeared. Instead of finding mean and devious ways to tease people, I concentrated on dealing with people in a more positive way. And as a result, I became popular. <laughs> albeit in a kind of Norm from Cheers kind of way, <laughs> what was much better than the alternative, which was to be lumped together with those toxic people from Brownwood. Those people skill adjustments that I made back in my college days became the core of what today I call the positive opposite. What is the positive opposite? The positive opposite is actually three steps. Step one, identify at the end of the day people who've left you thinking that they were jerks. Identify their behaviors and identify their attitudes. Step two, convert those negative behaviors and attitudes into something positive, more specifically, the positive opposite. And finally, step three, adopt those positive opposite attitudes and behaviors that you came up with in step two. And you will experience a number of benefits. One benefit is that you'll be likable, maybe even popular. Did you know that I am the vice president of membership for my Toastmaster club? <laughs> I don't believe that the members in my club would have elected me to that post if I was just a little bit of a jerk. <coughs> I am living proof that my approach works. A second benefit is that you'll be able to separate yourself from your peers. Now, I think we can all understand that for many people, it's easy to be mean. But did you know that the word mean comes from an old English word for common? The word common? How many people here want to be common? <laughs> <laughs> Let me ask you another question. How many people here remember Ernie Banks? Yeah. Let me see a show of hands. Ernie Banks wasn't just a good baseball player. He was world famous. He was Mr. Cub. And that was because of this overwhelmingly positive interactions he had with ordinary people. It didn't matter who you were, you were important. Isn't that a great way to be remembered? Wouldn't you want to be remembered the same way? On the other hand, there may be a number of ways that my approach can be criticized. Many people may feel that they've already got great interpersonal skills, that they're likable enough for it. My reply to that is that, as I said before, it's easy to be mean. There's a lot of temptation. What the positive opposite approach does is it keeps you on your guard. It prevents you from backsliding because you will always be reminded that you will not be that jerk or that toxic individual. A second criticism 
my approach is the fact that many jerks do not know that they are jerks. <laughs> my reply to that is that this approach empowers jerks. No, it doesn't empower them by making jerkier. No, it allows them to go outside of themselves, to take the negative experiences that they've had personally and to convert them into the positive opposite. If you think that the world is swarming, overwhelmed by jerks and toxic individuals, well then that's great! Because if you use this approach, you'll have lots of inspiration that allow you to perform the positive opposite. Clint Eastwood once said, sometimes if you want to see a change for the better, you have to grab matters by your own hands. Fellow Toastmasters, honored guests, dignitaries, by using these three steps that I identified before, identify, convert, adopt, You'll be able to do just that in improving your interpersonal skills, and hopefully, you'll improve your life. Bad contest, Master. Speech contestant number two, Edward Brown Lee, down by the riverside. Down by the riverside, Edward Brown Lee. And he became 
frustrated. He was struggling, trying to get, get, get out of the mud. And the dog started barking, Sam started barking. And so the herd backed up and walked away from the deer and went back into the forest. I quieted the dog, Sam, be quiet. Moments later, the herd came back. And they gathered around the little deer again. The little deer was struggling, struggling, and all of a sudden, the little deer just collapsed. He had exhausted himself, trying to free himself. That happens to a lot of us sometimes when we find ourselves trapped in the mud of life. We exhaust ourselves and we collapse. All of a sudden, a big buck walked out of the forest. Powerful chest, huge animals sitting on top of his head. And he walked through the herd. Looked like he said, get back, boys. <laughs> and then didn't take care of his business. So they parted the way and let him pass. And he walked over to the little deer laying in the mud and he said, Looked like to me, he looked down at him and he sounded like to me, he said, get up out of that mud. Get up out of the mud. And the little fella didn't move. Get up. And then he, he started to move. He started to move and then he, he, he stood up. And he shook the, shook the mud off of him. And he looked at his herd. And he walked back. And he started walking towards them, back into the forest, and the herd followed him in, into the forest. <clears throat> How many times in our lives have we been trapped and entangled in the mud of life? What do you do when you get entangled, when you get trapped? I know what that doe went through. You've been in the mud, I've been in the mud, all of us have been entrapped somewhere in our lives. I know what he was going through when he was struggling through the mud. I could see myself there, entangled. You see, I got a call one day from the VA. And it was my oncologist, so I had had an exam for prostate cancer. And he said, hey, uh, Brownlee, are you sitting down? I said, no, sir. He said, well, you need to be sitting down. Because you have something that's going to kill you unless you do something about it. My world collapsed. What you know, what you want me to do? You need an operation. I took that operation happily. But guess what? Just like that path in life, the twist and the turns in life, two years later that cancer came back. And here I am down in the mud all over again. And I asked my wife, so what do you think we should do? And she said, well, call your daddy. And so I called my father. And I said, daddy, I was crying like a baby. A grown man crying like a baby. I said, daddy, this thing came back. I don't know what to do. Son, get, said, son, get a hold of yourself. Get yourself together. Do you know who you are? I said, yes, sir, I know who I am. He said, well, get yourself together. Like that little buck. I thought about what Emerson said. It's not what's behind you. It's not what's before you, but what's inside of you. And what I learned down by the riverside in that mud, I learned that your passion for your purpose will give you the power to overcome any obstacle that you face in life. Madam Contest Chair.
international speech contestant number three, Terry Pigeon. Uncommon Valor. Uncommon Valor, Terry Pigeon. left 
And Dave was not about to give up. He remained calm. He stayed focused. He reached up with all his might. He grabbed the rear lines, pulled on them as hard as he could to level off the chutes. He managed, through his hard efforts, to bring the speed down to about 60 miles per hour. With only seconds left, about 200 feet left, he ordered Shirley to kick up her knees. He grabbed her knees and he leveled his body out just prior to impact. Remember, if you're in a tragic event with potentially fit, fatal co consequences, remain calm, stay focused, it will lead to a better outcome. Quarter mile away, the drop zone manager and Shirley's husband watched in horror as the two slammed violently into the ground with Dave taking the brunt of the impact. Astonishing as this may seem, not only was Shirley alive, she even tried to get up. Ah! Dave! Dave! No! The course of a few brief minutes, Dave, his soul was permanently branded upon Shirley. She longed for him to see her, to feel her, to touch her, heal me. <clears throat> oh, holy crap, I'm alive! <laughs> as astonishing as this may seem, after an extensive surgery, three days later, Shirley walked out of the hospital is leading a productive life today. <clears throat> Needless to say, Dave and Shirley are lifelong friends now. Madam Cullen, test manager, fellow Toastmasters, and honored guest, yes, the ultimate sacrifice is saving a stranger's life at your own peril. Neither Dave nor Shirley panicked during their entire ordeal. Both were willing to put the other's life ahead of theirs. Could you or would you? Thank you, man. Thank you. Speech contestant number four, Len Pisney. You can't judge a book by its cover. You can't judge a book by its cover, Len Pisney. Madam Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters, and our guests for this afternoon. She's struggling to find the keys in that big purse. The groceries in the cart are starting to get wet from the rain. And the baby in her arms is crying. Ma'am, hello, can I give you a hand? Can I hold the baby for you or help you find your keys? No, thank you. Okay, very good. She made a decision based on first impressions. She went with her gut feeling of her mother's intuition. And that's fine. She doesn't know me. She doesn't know if I'm a good guy. She doesn't know that I'm a grandfather, that I'm an elder in my church. She doesn't know I'm a Toastmaster. <laughs> Over the years, 
we have all come to realize or recognize certain roles or positions that are universally accepted as distrustful. So the used car dealer, <laughs> the guy on the corner in Chicago selling those Rolexes for 50 bucks. <laughs> and other people that we just can't we bring ourselves to trust. As a young boy, my mother always told me, and she told me many times over and over, you can't judge a book by its cover. <laughs> as a, sorry, Mom, as a young boy, that's the way it sounded. <laughs> <laughs> and so, what she wanted to teach me was not to jump to negative conclusions about people that look different than us, that were from another area. Don't judge just based on appearance only. So we know, we've talked about those negative uh, roles that we've run into. Well, at the same time, our society has deemed other positions to be trustworthy merely by their position and title. They had the assumption of trustworthiness. Let's take a look at some of those. Our elected members to Congress asked for our vote so they could bring integrity to Washington. <laughs> <laughs> Jesse Jackson Jr. may be reminded and said, that might be a little bit of misplaced trust. <coughs> so let's set our sights a little higher. Our governor. <laughs> now, I suspect there's a few Illinois people in the crowd. <laughs> and we all know that Rob Lagoyevich is just the latest example of why that job may be held in just a little too high esteem. All right, let's quit fooling around. Let's go right to the top. The highest position in the land, the presidency, one of the most powerful positions in the world. Richard Nixon and Bill Clinton taught us that they're just human too, subject to their temptations and frailties. Maybe politics is just way too easy. Let's look at some other positions around us. How about our police? They're hired and trained to protect us. That's part of their credo. They take an oath to do that. And Drew Peterson violated that trust beyond most of them. What about our coaches that we hire to spend endless hours with our children? Surely they have an expectation of integrity. And there's a guy named Jerry Sandusky out of Penn State that made parents regret for so many years that nobody challenged him. And then, there's the last bastion, our clergy. If we can't turn anywhere else, we can certainly turn there. These are men of the plot. These are men of extreme moral fiber. And unfortunately, in the last few years, we've come to know that that can be a disappointment also. So. My mother was right. You can't trust a book merely by its cover and form negative impressions, but neither should we give the assumption of a positive for those same reasons that we've talked about. So where does that leave me? What am I to teach my grandson as to who he can trust, how he should judge people? Well, maybe today's credo or axiom should go like this. Take everyone you meet at face value for today. Trust that gut feel. Trust that mother's intuition. And then realize that trust is theirs to earn and ours to grant. <coughs> she still hasn't found those keys. The groceries are totally soaked. And the baby is in complete meltdown. Ma'am, can I give you a hand? Can I hold the baby for you or help you find your keys? 
Should she answer any differently now? You be the judge. Mr. event. 
oftentimes, that person gains a brand new perspective on life. One of Sarah's favorite parts of her day is waking up and gazing out her window at the Chicago skyline. Life is full of ups and downs. But to fully appreciate the ups, we must know the downs. Anicca. There's an ancient Chinese proverb that tells a story of a farmer who tilled his field with an old horse. One day, the horse escaped and could not be found. When the neighbors heard the news, they exclaimed, oh, what bad luck. The farmer shrugged, bad luck, good luck, who knows? A few days pass and the horse returns with three wild mares. When the neighbors heard the news, they exclaimed, oh, what good luck. The farmer shrugged, good luck or bad luck, who knows? A few weeks pass, and as the farmer's son is working to tame the wild horses, he gets bucked off, and he breaks his leg. When the neighbors hear the news, they exclaim, oh, what bad luck. The farmer shrugged, bad luck, good luck, who knows. A month passes, and the Chinese army demands all young men join them to fight. The farmer's son doesn't have to go because of his broken leg. Good luck, bad luck. Who knows? Nothing is ever as bad as it seems or as good as it seems. Things are only things. And it's how to react that really matters. A neat job. Sarah once told me, yesterday is history, tomorrow is a mystery, but today is a gift. <coughs> That's why they call it the present. So next time you're experiencing one of life's woes, or it seems like you're in a stretch of bad luck, remember the concept of a Nietzsche. And now, ladies and gentlemen, you don't have to spend 10 days of silent meditation <laughs> to understand.
Lessons from a military trailblazer. Outstanding. Now, I have, I try to keep these questions limited because I try to learn as much as I can about the individual. And what caught my eye on your speech contestant profile, what inspires you the most is watching a light bulb go off. What? That's not me. <laughs> you are Jill Morgan, though, to my watching knowledge. Watching a light bulb go off. Is that not you? I, it's my writing. Well, the real <laughs> That's you, right? I swear to God, I didn't write it in. So don't let your moment. It's a Vaughn Senior moment. So I don't know the history that I burned a kernel on stage. So let's go back to your book. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, and you've talked about your book in other venues, but I'd like you to share with us that one point in time where you have now launched the book, I know that you're already mm -hmm. talking about it. Tell me the one story that you've experienced since the publishing of that book where you have made a direct impact on somebody and you knew it. Uh, I was speaking to a group of people and one woman came up to me afterwards, she had read the book, and she burst out crying talking to me. She was going through a terrible time. Her husband had just left her. She had four children. And she, she loved my last chapter, which is reinvent yourself because I went, I worked for one of those governors who went to jail, and I had to reinvent myself because no one would give me a job. And she found the inspiration in that chapter to get her life and just go forward, knowing that in a few years she'll look back and go, I am so glad I am rid of him. <laughs> <laughs> it's always a pleasure to have you. Thank you so much for continuing to inspire. Here is a certificate of participation. Thank you. Now we're going to run I'm glad you're here. It's on video now. <laughs> <laughs> She's Dale, my... how are you, sir? No, good. No, good. Excellent, sir. Same standardized three questions. Number one, how long have you been in Toastmasters? Uh, it's going to be a year, and I started off there one time. Uh, to rephrase that, it has been roughly 18 months. 18 months. Number two, what club are you representing in Arlen Park Toastmasters. I'm going to incorporate that in every presentation because there's always three, one or two people in the front, which is good. And finally, what is your current Toastmasters designation? I am a CC. Very cool. Adele, I've uh, communicated with you in the past, and I know that you are a visual interpreter for TEDx. Many of us have heard of TED or TEDx. Tell me a little bit about how you got involved with TEDx and what you do with that organization. All right, TEDx is basically the think tank to bring out ideas and actually have speakers come out and express ideas that the average person may not know about. You could go on YouTube and you see that. Well, the Naperville people decided that they want to do something different. They wanted to take and scribe basically a presentation, just like Jill has given, where hoo -ah! <laughs> And then they say, make it out of balloons. So I sat in the back room watching the live presentations going on, and I had a pre-script of actually what they were saying. 
So I would go through and, like Toastmasters, for all the attestants out here who have rewritten their scripts multiple times, and then came on stage and performed something totally different than was on script. <laughs> I am sitting in a back room, frantically listening to these great presentations where somebody went, disability, I'm like, disability, what do I have for disability? It's got to be a balloon, I got to be a balloon, what do I have? And I'm just sitting there going, and, I, and so I built a wheelchair, disability, yes, and then they talked about mental disability, and went out. <laughs> it wasn't in the script. So I had to actually think on my feet and actually customize balloon sculptures for these presentations. It was the first time it's ever been in the history of TED. Um, it was a success. I'm hoping that Boston is looking at possibly picking up this concept. It is something that is very frustrating because I'm working with a project that is guaranteed to break. And then I have to take this crazy, fun, filled idea that's being presented on stage, communicate it into a balloon where people could come later on and just say, wow, that reminds me of their presentation. <laughs> so that's what I did at TEDx, which was a thrill ride because it was a day of me being hooked up into a little room just listening and watching <laughs> fun presentations. <laughs> thank you so much for participating. Thank you. Questions for you. Number one, how long have you been with Toastmasters? Believe it or not, I've been with Toastmasters four months. That's fantastic. Uh, what club are you representing this afternoon? The Hispano Americano uh, Toastmasters. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Any hat members? Woohoo! <laughs> 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 and finally, what is your current Toastmasters designation? I'm CC Alton. Wow, fantastic. Very good. David, there's so many things I could pick up this, but I'm going to go ahead with two things that have jumped off the page for me. And I want to make sure that I'm reading your writing right now. I should apologize. I should ask this earlier. But you are the president of Subueno Salud. Subueno Salud, right. Subueno Salud is a, basically a second career for me. I'm a former banker. And after leaving banking, I uh, had started off working with the Hispanic community in promoting awareness for cardiovascular health. And in the uh, actions I've taken to promote awareness and better eating, better living, more exercise, and certainly taking the right supplements, I happened to go uh, and uh, introduce uh, certain uh, uh, habits to a friend of mine who owns a radio station. And he felt so good and, and improved his cardiovascular health so much with my advice and the supplements that he invited me over. And there started for me a career in Hispanic radio, and I called it Su Buena Salud, which means you're good health. So I'm continuing. Not right now I have my own radio program Saturday mornings at 7.15 on 1450 AM, uh, Radio Formula. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much for participating. <laughs> Greg, how are you, sir? I'm real good, thank you. Awesome, very good. Standardized three questions. Number one, how long have you been with Toastmasters? Since August. All right, and number two, what club are you representing this afternoon? Donner's Grove. My kids, absolutely my best source of the irony of journeys of life. Um, they, neither of them live at home at this point, but uh, so I'm running out of material. Uh, which is kind of <laughs> but um, I will point out one thing. My son um, is a broadcaster for uh, ESPN Radio uh, out of West Palm Beach, Florida. And when he moved down there, now I love my son, but an organized human being, he's not. And, um, my wife and I decided, you know, we really need to keep tabs on him, but we really both can't afford to go down there every month or six weeks together, so we'll go separately. Well, I didn't get to go down there, and I'll never forget it. It was in 2007. It was in February of 2007. I left Midway, 
and it was 7 degrees. And I got off in West Palm Beach, and it was 77 degrees. And my son got off of work, came to see me. Now, understand, broadcasting, it sounds really good, but when you first start, you're making well below minimum wage, okay, considering the hours you put in. So the kid basically has, has no money. But we went out to a restaurant in West Palm, which is a very upscale community, and we're eating outside. And he said, Dad, I have to go to the Washington Fine. And I'm sitting there, and I'm looking around, and we're going, okay, he lives here. I live in this God forsaken tundra. <laughs> and periodically, I have to send him money. And if that's not absurd, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> that's <laughs> what I'm going to I'm sure you're coming now, and I think my son and your son could probably give us a blood from your father. Roger, how are you, sir? Fine, thank you. I'm doing well. Thank you for asking. Okay, I have three questions. Number one, how long have you been with Toastmasters? Been in Toastmasters for something in the neighborhood of 31 or 32 years. Uh, Roger, what club are you here representing this afternoon? Club 4888, Hinsdale Toastmasters. <laughs> Toastmasters designation. Well, I earned that designation so long ago it was back when we gave three <coughs> letters, not two. So I'm an ATM. Okay, very nice. Roger, one of the things that caught my eye in your speech contestant profile, your quotes. Why put off until tomorrow what you can put off indefinitely? <laughs> now, I'd like for you to share with me because son is like this, my wife can be like this sometimes, <laughs> and nobody goes back home and tells me so. <laughs> But I also know that I can be like this at certain points, and I always have my wife that will clean up after me. Who cleans up after you when you follow this book? One of two people. Either me, when I'm finally pressured into doing what I've been putting off indefinitely, or nobody. <laughs> One of those two people. <laughs> so did anybody have you, I mean, you're here, obviously, yeah. and you've been through two other club con two other contests. Mm -hmm. How did you get here? Did you do this on your own? Did you say, I'm going to do this? Or did somebody or did nobody show you? And it just happened. Well, well no. We we had a table topics contest at the club level and of course went to the area and, and had had the contest there, so Nobody really had to push me into it. I've been in the contest before. I've actually made it I've made it to the district level twice, but not in this contest. I've been there in the humorous speech, and I've been there in the speech evaluation many years ago. But not in this contest. Very good. Roger, thanks once again for competing this afternoon. Thank you. Three questions. Number one, how long have you been with Toastmasters? I've been with Toastmasters a little over two years. Okay. And what club are you representing here this afternoon? Ambitech Toastmasters, and I'm it. Woo! Yeah. 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 What is your current Toastmasters designation? I have a uh, competent leader. Competent leader, very good. Now, Ruth, I know you're an engineer. You've talked about being an engineer. You've talked about how difficult it is for your engineer colleagues to be able to transition from the engineer mind to communications. And you seem to have done a very good job of that. What's it like being on the outside when you go back to your engineering friends and say, oh, you guys can't like this? <laughs> well, if you look closely, you'll see I've actually listed my current occupation as project manager. So unfortunately, sometimes I am the person on the other side. I am at a corporate club, and I'm right now the only project manager and feeling a little lonely and wondering why it is the people whose business it is to communicate because the client wants to know what we're doing, the leads would like to know what the other people are doing, the leads would like to know when the client is going to give us the information. It's our business to communicate. And so I always thought it would be really, really easy to get lots of other project managers in our club, but for whatever reason, it's all technical folks, and I'm the only project manager. So <laughs> <laughs> Ruth, my last question for you. You've, you've written here that what inspires you most is the big night sky. What inspiration do you draw, derive from that? It's perhaps a bit of a cliche, but there's nothing for putting things in perspective, like looking up, 
seeing and that inky, inky blackness, all those little tiny twinkling lights. And as I mentioned earlier today, I'm from Nebraska. There isn't really much of a sky here in Chicago. You look up and it's kind of pink. But in Nebraska, or in a little town in the middle of Iowa, Boone, Iowa, is the darkest skies I've ever seen. You can look up, there is nothing on the horizon. There's just all those little lights. And the place where that puts me, I find difficult to explain. Well, Ruth, thanks so much for coming this afternoon. Contest Toastmaster Tiffany Sumenko and all of the international speech contestants that compete this afternoon. Jill Morgenthau has been one of my um, mentors and 
per people that encouraged me, and when she got hers done, and that really put the fire under me. So I'm, I'm running out after you, Jill. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what we do. We encourage each other around here. So thank Absolutely. you so much thank for meeting. Thank you. What club are you representing today? Daughters Row.
really quickly. So you say, for your interests and hobbies, volunteering at a pet shelter. Is that a local shelter? Yes, the Dot Pet Shelter in Naperville. Have you brought any pets home with you? I have, yes. My boyfriend's Zach over there, and I have brought home a <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 